1997, you produced Peter Satira. And then in 1998, you left EMI and co-founded your first co-venture with Donna Hilly and Sony Tree. Tell us about that co-venture. Uh, well, uh, EMI and Sony ATV had been great competitors. You know, mm -hmm. it, they, they, they fought year in and year out to, to, to see who would be publisher of the year at the BMI and ASCAP awards. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody knew everybody else at the companies there. No, they were sort of, along with, with Warren Chapel music at the time, they were sort of the big three. And, um, uh, and even though, you know, I knew Donna peripherally. I, I really didn't have much of a relationship with her. So when I was invited to leave EMI. <laughs> um, <laughs> <ba> <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, she called, she called me out of the blue and said, Mark, it's Donna Hilly. And uh, she didn't sound like that. She sounded like her. Um, <laughs> and she said, so what are you up to these days? I said, well, I'm, other than being fired, I'm not doing a whole lot. And she said, you know, I've, I've always um, um, liked what you've done, like, like what you were doing in the business, and are you interested in starting a joint venture publishing company with my company? And I said, I mean, before she even finished saying it, I said, yes, yes. I literally couldn't believe it. Um, Woody Bomar was her second in command at that point, and mm -hmm. he was, uh, had reached out to me also. And um, uh, I remember we, we made a publishing production management deal with them, uh, and the deal was done start to finish in nine days. Sounds complicated. And, in fact, <laughs> uh, Malcolm Mims was my attorney at that point. Uh, we'd gone into our office to sign the contract, um, and we had pictures and all that stuff. And after um, after the pictures and after the signing of the contract, she asked Malcolm if he would stay behind for a minute, mm -hmm. and every, all all the rest of us left. Yeah. Um, and so I was very curious what that was about, and so I called Malcolm and I said, "So, are you?" able to tell me what she wanted to talk to you about? He says, yeah, okay. I, I said, well, <laughs> what? Yeah. He says, well, she just asked me one question. And I said, which was? She said, Malcolm, what in the hell did I just sign? <laughs> <laughs> because the deal was so complicated and had all these different That's what areas. I just said it. It, uh, sounded, it sounds complicated. And yeah, and uh, but you know, we just had incredible, incredible success together. And I just, you know, I, I know, I just I know, always loved her. I know. You know, it, it's funny because um, I don't, and I don't know why, but the terminology co-venture. Okay, this comes up periodically. And every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll turn to who, a friend of mine, a songwriter or whoever here in town, right? And, I, and I'll say, do you know what a co-venture is, actually, and, and why co-ventures happen? And just about every person I've ever asked that question of doesn't really know the answer, okay? Mm -hmm. So could you explain to us a little bit about why would why would there be a co-venture? Well, I can, I can get I can get you know? drilled down very deep on that, but I won't. Okay. I'll I'll say this. Yeah. Co-ventures exist because of an opportunity that the funding publishing company thinks might exist. Ah. In other words, they're gonna say, okay, Joe Schmo, Mark Bright. We want to make it. We want to do a joint venture with you because of your relationships and right. your your area of influence. Right. We want to be in business with that, and, and we that's will, and why we will fund that, and we will fund it. Ah, uh, okay. and if um, but you know the caveat is, you have to absolutely almost in every one of these I've ever seen, you you have to be well in the black in year five. Yeah, yeah, and um, and in order to do that, you pretty much need to start having success with that thing in that first year. Right. Somehow, some way. And boy, you did. Dang. Um, Mark signed Brett James. <laughs> yeah, who a, lot of, who a lot of you know, of course. 
and um, Brett had how many cuts in the first year? Like 44 cuts? He did. I mean, it, was, it was really crazy. I had worked with Brett back in our EMI days together. He was a, um, a songwriter artist signed to Arista Careers record. Yeah. Um, that, that record went nowhere fast. Uh, but EMI had signed into a six-figure publishing deal. Mm -hmm. Well, when when the, the 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 record didn't pan out, didn't sell anything, they they dropped him. They had so he to. lost his record deal. He lost and his, his publishing and his publishing deal. deal. So I went to him. Um, now, uh, at that point in time, when you approached him, had he had any cuts as a he writer? Had never had a cut outside of the songs he recorded for his so own album. So why did you approach him? There was there just some. What was um, it about Brett well, that you I, saw? Well, uh, I there was. My own thought about it, but there was also an independent thought. My friend Michael Martin, mm -hmm. uh, who now runs ASCAP, mm -hmm. uh, said, "You know, you you know that they just dropped Brett." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, they sure did." And it really got me thinking. Um, I should call him because I I had a good relationship with him, and I thought he was brilliant. I thought he was passionate, and uh, I thought, you know what, I could probably sign him f for very little. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I did, and I, I don't know how much you want me to go into that, but you know the the moment that I signed him about I don't know a month after the, signing I'd him for, for I'd love to I know signed him for twenty five thousand dollars. Okay. And um, and about a month and a half after that, he says he called me and said I need to have breakfast with you. Okay. We go to Pancake Pantry, have breakfast, and he says. I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. So bad news first, dude. He said, well, my, my daddy pulled some strings and got me back into med school, in which he'd already school. quit before. Back in Oklahoma. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, and I, I, I can't live on $25,000. I've got a family. I said, I understand, but yeah. that's what I had to offer. And, and of course, you accepted. Uh, he said, I can't. It's, I, I need to get back into med school. But mm -hmm. you know what? I've met this, this guy named Troy Virgis, and we've been writing some great songs together, and I make you a promise that we will literally, he'll drive down to Oklahoma every weekend, and we'll write songs. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, yeah. I'm in. Yeah. So I've, you know, we, we continued with the deal, and then um, 11, 10, 10, 11 months later, we had gotten over 40 songs recorded on, with those two guys and, and Hillary Lindsay yeah. and, and that, that, that trio. And uh, it was just, it was crazy how um, and that worked. And of course, a lot of it had to do with, I, I hired this song plugger named Kelly King, uh -huh. uh, and she really developed a great relation, working relationship with Brett and those other writers. And she fostered those relationships and uh, it was just unbelievable. And one of the uh, one of the first cuts we got. In fact, his first cut was not a single, but it was on that Faith Hill Breathe album that sold. Love is 10, a sweet. Love is a sweet thing. Love is a sweet thing. Sold ten million records. I know. <laughs> I know. Unbelievable. And and you um, you also had. Um, Martina McBride's Blessed. Yes. And, and Jessica Andrews, Who I Am. Who I Am was I uh, mean, the first geez. single. Uh, that was our first number one yeah. together as, a, as yeah. a, a Brett and I as a publisher. Yeah. Unbelievable. And then um, in 205, you sold Terracell. Yeah. Right? Yep. And um, we did you get a load of this. Mark sold Terracell for the largest multiple ever paid for a co-venture at that point in time. At the time, yeah. And at it the just, time. you know, and it, right? and it was because um, we just, it was a young catalog, but we had so many hits in I it know. that it made it just very attractive, attractive yeah. and we had a lot of companies after it. And of I course, uh, joint ventures have been sold for many times that now, mm -hmm. but at the time it yeah, was. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah. Yeah, um, some of the, some of the uh, songs, of course, in the catalog included Kenny Chesney's "When the Sun Goes um, When the Sun Goes Down," Rascal Flatts' "Bless the Broken Road," God, um, uh, Carrie Underwood's "Jesus Take the Wheel," um, and and um, and then you started my um, my good girl music right from that point on right right which um, eventually turned into Chatterbox Music right. which is now your artist development company 
exactly right. Okay, I got it right. That you did good, James. How about that? <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> hard to keep up with all these company yeah, names and everything. But, but, but really, you know, these. And we're going to talk about all the yeah, artists great. development that you're, that you're doing a little later. Okay. Great. Right. Um, but yeah. you know, all these companies exist because of um, my passion for artist development. So, mm -hmm. and and if you know, we've bought and sold those catalogs along the way, yep. and uh, and it's allowed me. Um, to work with new artists that mm -hmm. um, that maybe nobody else will take a chance on, or do, or that I get to hear before everybody yeah. else. Yeah, well, you are an incredible talent picker, yeah, talent scout. I guess you know I should probably use the right terminology, and um, you know, I forgot to mention when we were talking about you know that period of time that Mark was going through um, all of that. I just forgot to mention that along the way he just happened to discover an act called Rascal Flats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just great. just by chance. And um and I understand that it was um Mila Mason it that was. actually called you up yep. and got you down to Printer's Alley. At, were they playing? They were playing Tell at the, the fiddle story. and steel guitar bar yeah. and down in Printer's Alley. And uh um, Milo was a friend of my, my, mine and my partners at the time, and, and uh, she would just drop by on occasion and hang out and mm -hmm. uh, maybe listen to songs or play us songs. But she came by one afternoon in the, in the summer of, I, I believe it was maybe 1999 or 2000, somewhere in there, and uh, said, you know, there's a, these guys playing down on Printer's Alley. You, 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 need, to, you need to go see them. You need to go check them out. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, my love, that's great. You know, and, but she kept coming back about the third time. We thought, we okay. should go down there and check it out. Yeah. And uh, we went down there and, and heard these blokes playing and a bunch of young dudes and um, thought, good grief. They're, yeah, they're I was going to ask incredible. you. I mean, when you, when um, you sat in the audience and you heard them for the first time, I mean, what was going on in your I, mind? Uh, well, the, the the thing that was going on was that in my mind was that lead singer can sing his tail off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's country, but I do know he can sing his tail off. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, just casually after after that show invited him to the office, and a couple of days later they show up, and there's like six of them, um, and <laughs> we're thinking, wow. I, there's three of these guys we don't even know. We yeah. didn't even meet. And yeah. they were kind of like part of the posse, I think. Yeah. And uh, um, they sang for us. And um, we said, you know, we pulled Gary aside and said, listen, man, if, if, the, if the three of you will show up maybe tomorrow or the next day after, we, we can talk some business. And mm -hmm. so um, Gary and Joe Don and Jay came back and um, um, – we struck up a deal and uh, and made a contract and what was it like a production deal? It was a publishing production deal because I had the deal with Donna Healy, which allowed me right. to have funds, yeah, but not quite enough. I mean, so I, all of I a sudden that complicated contract started to make sense. Yes, um, <laughs> that. Uh, but the problem was I I didn't have enough money inside the joint venture budget to get them off the road. Right. Uh, because two of them were playing in Shelley Wright's road band. Okay. And uh, Joe Don and Jay. Mm -hmm. And Gary was digging, um, digging up ground to where the company he worked for could put above ground swimming pools in. He would flatten out the ground with a shovel. And so every afternoon they'd come in, he would just come in smelling like a pig. I mean, it's just horrible, you know, because he, he came right from work and he was drenched in sweat. The other two guys, you know, uh, were kind of young little 90-pound uh, weakling-looking dudes. and yep. and um, <laughs> But, you know, we started working with it vocally, and, and, and it was – it was sort of life changing in the sense that, boy, you know, and this I, could be, this could really be something. Yeah. And. Um, and how much development did you? How long a period of time before you actually? It was not long. Did a it was a, It was about. Them. We developed probably. Um, we had them in development for approximately eight months. Okay. 
Um, and it, and that, that time, the whole idea was to try to, you know, get a blend and, and get um, Jodon working out some upper body weights and, you know, and, and getting a, uh, some yeah. haircuts and some showers and, sure. Sure. <laughs> you know, those kind of things. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was so funny to, to think about it because they were, you know, they had no money. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, um, I had to, um, uh, I had, had gotten my house paid off at the time. I had to go get another mortgage on it just to, to have enough money to get them to, to be off the road mm -hmm. and uh, to pay for um, the production costs and uh, instruments and so forth and so on. So right. uh, it was sort of one of those deals that had it not worked, I would have been in deep, deep financial Doo -doo. trouble. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it would have not been pretty.